said help! There's a fucking maniac outside my room! He's gonna make me review a shitty knockoff anime! Stop laughing! You, you creepy son of a bitch! You're not making me watch another Korean chop job! You can't keep me out forever. Well, the fuck I can't! You can just rot out there for all I can- Another winter has come, Spoonie. It is... Diatron 5. Some of you may remember mine and Spoonie's video some years back talking about Space Thunder Kids. Rest assured it was a complete turd pile, but in covering the video, I feel that maybe we have misrepresented what Space Thunder Kids actually is. In the vaguest description possible, Space Thunder Kids is the result of producer Joseph Lai recutting existing Korean knockoff cartoons into one unruly mess of a movie. This sort of explains why characters shift appearance on a whim and why plot lines were introduced, only to be swiftly abandoned. There was no way that Space Thunder Kids was going to be anything other than a complete mess. So, considering that, it doesn't seem so... horrendous. Barely. Now, Diatron 5, on the other hand, doesn't have that excuse. It's presented entirely as it was intended. Skull-fucking incompetence and all. It's damn near pitiful how everything about this movie is so awful. You'd think even the most hapless idiot would get at least something right, but even by sheer accident. Where do you keep finding this garbage? Spoony, that's not the question you should be asking. No, what you should be asking is, haven't I seen this before? No! It's not! It is. It's the same goddamn beginning as Space Thunder Kids. Actually, it's not quite the same. While Space Thunder Kid's beginning was filled with dead air, Diatron 5 is filled with a loud, grinding score. Thankfully, they managed to tone it down so we can hear this brilliant dub. Chinese pilot will pass here in 10 seconds with hundreds of meteor- 10 seconds? Does that mean we can avoid the collision with the Earth? You may feel at ease. Say, Spoonie, uh, between Diatron 5 and Space Thunder Kids, which has the worst opening? Oh, they're both just... Awful. Oh, come on, what kind of answer is that? Alright, um, like, uh, a gun pointed to your head and you had to choose between the two, what would you choose? Death sounds wonderful right about now. Fine, if you're gonna be like that. Maybe next time I won't force you to watch another Korean knockoff show, then what will you do? Be happy? It's actually kind of funny to see this scene within its original context, complete with redundant shots of that same crew member falling ass overhead backwards, though one does wonder why the captain here sounds like he's talking through a bullhorn. Maintain the stability of the fleet. Pay attention to your own security. Apparently, this space force is dependent upon a so-called girl genius to maintain the planet's defenses. How exactly is never explained, but given the people that are at the control boards, I think I can understand why they outsource the help. Huh? Well, that's a strange looking bleep. Wonder what that is. Uh, Commander, uh, there's a strange looking object on the radar. Strange object. Oh, uh, yeah, it looks like a spaceship or something. Well, gee golly gosh, Commander, looks like we're in for an intergalactic hoot, man. The ship that Corporal Gomer Pyle saw on the radar manages to evade their sensors by laughingly hiding behind some asteroids. 
I'm not even going to ask how it's possible that ship is moving like that, because I'm more interested in how they managed to sneak one of their agents into a meteorite that crashes down on the nearby planet so he can incapacitate the girl genius who's somehow responsible for the planet's space defense force. You heard what I said. And if you somehow forget the girl genius is in this movie, well, don't you worry, because this film will leave you plenty of reminders. The threat of attack from outside forces is automatically percepted by the sensory powers of the girl genius. It's all due to the girl genius, you know. She has the highest IQ on the Earth, more than capable of dominating the automatic defenses. Where is that location? Let's see. Uh, that's right about where Girl Genius lives. Girl Genius? Hey, buddy, don't act so surprised. I mean, it's possible there's a Girl Genius. Just like I'm sure that somewhere out there in the universe, lead spontaneously transforms into gold. Well, the agent manages to slip through the impenetrable defenses of the Girl Genius's mansion and bulldozes his way to her room where he shoots her prompting his general to contact the planet and laughably demand surrender in tribute. Your girl genius has been shot by our agent. From now on, I shall be your leader. I shall personally take control of your star command fleet. Prepare to welcome me. Maybe then you can keep your lives. Ah, uh, not without the approval of the space immigration office. <laughs> Is that so? Yeah, that's so. We have a system here in place, buddy, and if you want to take over our planet and impose military rule, you have to run it through our immigration office. What? And the Space Thunder Kids flashbacks continue as we launch into a poorly animated and choppy space battle. Highlights include a robot crab that pinches cannons shut, loud soaring ships despite being in a vacuum, and a robot that hurls unprotected crew members into space to die screaming horrible deaths. I can relate. Come on, you're just being maudlin. For the past three years, I've shown you the worst titles I know of and leave you a pitiful shell of the man you once were. One would think you'd be used to it by now. It seems like the bug robot has the entire Starfleet on the verge of defeat, and with the girl genius's life hanging by a thread, Professor What's-His-Face and the two assistants decide to take matters into their own hands. Uh, what do you think of my automobile, huh? It's not an automobile, but an armored tank, Professor. Uh, 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 it does come in handy. <laughs> Are you going to fight the enemy with this tank, Professor Tang? Certainly not. This is my private automobile. Then why the fuck are you riding in it, numbnuts? Hey, the man built himself a tank. Let him enjoy it. I know I enjoy cruising the streets in my own personal jet-powered Segway. <laughs> <laughs> Bitches be flocking like pigeons on spilled popcorn. They flock to you on a Segway? <laughs> a jet-powered Segway, thank you very much. Oh, normally I wouldn't be caught dead on one of those things, but the man at the dealer wasn't giving me many options, and I will be goddamn before I'm seen trying to cruise with Betty's in a fucking zap car. Isn't there, like, something you should be working on right now? Ah, yes, indeed. Those nanobots aren't going to build themselves. Ooh, that's an idea. Now, how to reduce the memory to input such a code as to bridge the midichlorian gap into the How the, the fuck do you live with that guy? The three make their way to some giant robot named Diatron 3 that maybe the professor built? The pilot is yet another robot who has the voice of Tristan from Yu-Gi-Oh! Abridged, and he blasts off to fight the insect bot to the tune of what sounds like an ice cream truck jingle. Oh, yes. I mean, every word I said. Is everything ready, my fam? Everything's ready, sir. This is an urgent mission. Win this one. Aye, aye, Professor. I hate you so fucking much. While the robot does battle with the robot in the robot, the rest of the three are still stumped as to how they can cure the girl genius. Apparently, the bullet that was fired into her was coated with a deadly bacteria. Why the fuck it needed to be coated with bacteria when a bullet to the head can kill most anybody, I don't know. However, the head doctor has a means of fighting the infection, by pulling a fantastic voyage and send a team of shrunk down people to fight the infection. Unfortunately, this plan is overheard by some shifty-eyed doctor who tries to make a break for it. Luckily, he stopped cold from doing God knows what. 
Now let's see who you really are. <gasps> it's some guy we've never seen before. Professor What's-His-Face calls for the retreat of Diatron 3 and the robot pilot. Uh, Bifon? Bifon, there's been a change of plans. Withdraw immediately. Withdraw? But why? They retreat back to the planet and are prepared to be shrunk down to fight the infection in the girl genius. And for some reason, this scene is backed with what sounds like two people playing ping pong in an echo chamber. <laughs> Bifon is injected with Diatron 3 into the Girl Genius, and for some reason, the body of the Girl Genius is actually another world entirely, complete with caves, a starry night sky, and impish-looking creatures. Are they supposed to be the infection? How are they sentient? And how do they come across the materials to make spears in a fucking human body? I mean, they're stretching a metaphor, and then there's being amazingly stupid. <laughs> and it doesn't end there, folks. It... Never ends. Apparently an evil empire, dubbed the Red Empire, has taken over the girl genius's body, or this world, or whatever the fuck this place is supposed to be. I cannot believe this was intended for any viewing audience outside of a POW camp. The Red Empire's forces are led by a combat commander, Marie, who launches an attack on Diatron 3 and promptly destroys it. The robot doesn't have any brains. How can he lose with superior weaponry? How can that robot crumble so easily, like cookies? Watch your mouth, Dr. Bear! Come again? Watch your mouth, Dr. Bear! Okay, you know, I've resigned to the fact that the voice acting in this movie is beyond incompetent, but I refuse to accept the fact that this was an acceptable line by anyone's standards. Spoonie, you don't understand. What is there to understand? This is beyond incompetent. This is beyond all rational thinking and logic. No, seriously, you don't understand. Dr. Bearer is the character's name, see? Oh. Carry on, then. With the robots destroyed and captured, the professor sends Bunny and Joel off into the girl genius to save the day. Uh, by the by, I think the guy's name is Joel, but every time it's uttered, it sounds like Joel. Oh, it's more beautiful than I ever imagined! Wake up, Bunny. We're not here for sightseeing, you know. Oh, Joel, I just want to enjoy the scenery. You're too fussy. It seems that one of the main components of the robot that they're piloting, Diatron 5, has veered off course, and Bunny and Joel are left to try to find it. Without this crucial component, they are unable to transform into Diatron 5's robot form and be left- WHAT?! There are waterfalls inside the girl's body? And look, there are trees and plants- Who the fuck are they?! You're surrounded. Throw down your weapons and surrender. Then maybe we'll let you live. Joel, that's the White Soldiers. They're on our side. One. Why the fuck does Bunny know who they are and not Joel? Two, do you mean to tell me that those are supposed to be white blood cells? Three, how the fuck did you manage to make less sense than Space Thunder Kids? Realizing that they're all on the same side, Bunny and Joel are led to the king of the girl genius's body, and there's like, I don't know, there's noodles growing on trees and bread? When did this turn into a fucking Care Bears knockoff? <laughs> I'm gonna get a bucket for him, take it home. Ah! Oh. Look at him, he's all covered with ice cream. Get out of there, you're gonna get the ice cream dirty. I am... I am so sorry. Why is there a fucking candy land inside a girl's body? Why is there a fucking river made of ice cream? And why the fuck does the king of this land sound like a drunk Mexican laborer going through puberty? It used to be a very peaceful place before the Red Soldiers started receiving heavy artillery support from the outside. Now we're like a moth in a flame. The king sends his best warrior, Samba, along with ten other men to help Joel and Bunny destroy the Red Empire. 
As they split off to attack, Joel and Bunny come across Bifon, who has since been reappropriated into a service bot for Combat Commander Marie, and I can't believe I just said that sentence. Back with Bunny and Joel, Bifon swears revenge on Marie, and man, does he ever get it. Oh. You horrible villain! What? <laughs> say what the fuck did we just watch i don't think i've been rendered speechless so many times by just watching something there is something something has to be at work here all right there's no way that this was just lost in translation this has to be intentional let's just move on bunny and joel force marie to get them an audience with the red empire's leader who turns out to be mr spock However, it seems that Emperor Spock has captured Samba and the rest of the White Soldiers and tricks Joel into falling into a pit with Great Cthulhu at the bottom. Stand back! I'll give you one more chance! Are you going to be eaten by the virus or are you going to be my loyal servant? Hmm? Wait a minute. If that's the virus, then who the fuck are you guys? I mean, were they always there? Were there always little people living inside her body with, like, ice cream springs and castles? And kings that sound like Mexican laborers? Emperor Spock just says fuck it and forces Joel into the Cthulhu pit. Luckily, Joel finds a convenient tunnel and escapes into an underground stream. He's washed ashore in the neutral zone and is found by these two whose existence is never really explained. Though they typically don't like outsiders in their land, they decide to make an exception and help Joel out. All the useless things in this universe are piled up here. There's nothing, nothing really that's of any use. It's all been thrown away as waste, you see? Oh. So... If this place is where all the waste goes, does that mean that Joel just washed up in the girl genius's ass? In the mother of all conveniences, Joel finds the main controller to Diatron 5 and is now able to transform into the title of the movie. Meanwhile, though, it seems that the Red Empire has found where Joel had run off to and kills the woman Sherry, leaving her man Crackle, no, really, his name is Crackle, to grieve. What could be in emotional scene is rendered completely silly because the soundtrack sounds like an auto-tune fly gone into Vangelis's recording studio. to take revenge, Crackle joins Joel on his assault on the Empire. The assault looks completely one-sided as Joel pilots the transformed Diatron 5 through pretty much every defense thrown his way. Realizing he's lost the day, Emperor Spock decides to initiate the Fortress's self-destruct sequence, but Crackle won't let the Emperor retreat to safety that easily. Ha 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 ha, I'm gonna stay here and watch you die. What? I know that's what Sherry would want me to do. Oh yes, killing yourself in a completely petty fashion is exactly what your girlfriend would want you to do. If your girlfriend was Bella Swan. While the Emperor manages to gain the upper hand by nearly tripping Crackle into the Cthulhu pit, he only winds up being a snack for the thing that should not be. With the fortress crumbling around them, Joel insists that Crackle come with him and escape. But Crackle declines and instead shoots something that makes the fortress explode. With Bifon the robot and Bunny still trapped inside somewhere. Wow. What a douche. However, the day's still not yet won, as there's still the invading force from earlier to deal with. <laughs> I completely forgot about them, too. With the girl genius cured, I think, Diatron 5 is excreted out of her body through a tear, and regains its original size before blasting off into space to fight the invaders, all to the warbling tune of some garage band that are making up the lyrics on the spot. <laughs> That is 
is literally how it ends. No denouement. Just the end. All right. I'll admit, that one was particularly bad. And I apologize for it. But wasn't it fun to rip it a new one? I'll tell you what. Next time, I'll pick one that's less... No! <laughs>